All right. Yeah, you guys keep giving up. That's amazing. I love it. It's such an incredible time. It's such an incredible day. And I just want to take one more moment. Can you guys just put your hands together for the amazing volunteers that were here all day yesterday investing in the kids? Uh, it was truly, truly incredible and inspiring to see uh, people get here early in the morning, smiling faces. And at the end of the day, um, it was like VBS didn't even happen. They came in and just cleared all that out. It's such an incredible time. We are thankful that I get to be a part of this incredible team. Uh, real quick, we're going to dive into the message. I know there may be um, one or two. Uh, we do have a preschool class. So if anybody in the room or if any of the preschoolers would like to go back, you can go back there. Um, there's a class. If not, we are so glad you're in here, right? You guys are awesome. Um, we love Family Celebration Sunday. And the biggest reason is... It's because uh, if you guys know me, I spent about seven years in youth ministry before we planted this church. And so many studies have shown us that if you help incorporate the generations in with the adults, that you see this sticky faith begin to happen because the younger generations see you worshiping. They see you diving into the word. They see you taking notes and that, that sticks with them. They understand that and they say, this is important. And they learn how to come to church and just come to church. So when they go to college, uh, they don't say, hey, where's my ministry? They just jump into a church and they add value there. And so it's incredible that we get to build off that foundation. And one of our core values is to bridge the generations. And so uh, I love the fact that uh, we have a, a lot of different generations represented in this room. And so uh, we hope you have an incredible time. It was, it was such a cool thing to see on the video, uh, how much what God was doing and all the seeds that were planted in each and every child is such a beautiful thing. And so if you're joining us for the first time, uh, we are so thankful and honored you were here. My name is Daniel Kasnay. Uh, I get the privilege and the honor to be the lead pastor here at the Bridge Church. And uh, in your worship guide, there's a lot of information for you, but there's also a little connect card. And we would love to connect with you. That's We just want to keep you in the loop. And so if you have that card, just fill that out. Um, if you have specific information, and on the back you'll see we even have prayer requests on there. So if you'd love to receive prayer about something, uh, we, you will we will take that up at the end of service, and then uh, we have a prayer team that will be praying over all these prayer requests uh, to help us stay connected as a church. Now, we are in a series, okay? Uh, it is entitled Living the Dream, and we've been talking about this guy named Joseph in the book of Genesis and talking about what does it mean to live the dream, live the calling that God has on our life. And so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 41 this morning. Genesis chapter 41, if you don't have your Bibles or don't have it on your phone or app or iPad, whatever it is, we're going to have it on the screens for you as well uh, to do that. And then if you'd love to take notes, we got a little note section on the back of the worship guide as well. Um, and then we're going to dive right in, okay? But I'd love to pray for us before we do. Uh, so let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and open up your truth, God. Thank you for all the amazing volunteers, all the parents, all the students and uh, kids that were involved yesterday, God, that uh, you worked through all of them. I saw uh, kids interacting with other kids and community being created in that moment. Thank you for moving, God. Thank you for still saving souls in 2019. Uh, we love you, God. I pray that you move in the midst of each and every one of our lives this morning, that you speak directly to our hearts. God, I pray that I will decrease so that you may increase. I pray that you move like a mighty wind in this place. And we ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Very good. Uh, so I, I, we've been talking about this idea. And I believe that each and every one of us in this room, young, no matter where you are in this aspect of life, that God has placed a dream inside of your life, maybe even a vision inside of your life that you look forward into the future and say, hey, this is where God is calling me to. And maybe you're at the point where you're saying, hey, I got so much going on, I can't see, uh, but maybe the next day what's going on in my life. And my prayer is that through this series, God begins to work in your heart and to reveal certain truths and principles that help us catapult us into the future and saying, God, what do you have for me? What calling do you have in my life? Because I believe each and every one of us have that calling. And so we've been talking this whole series. Now I want to encourage you, if you didn't hear some of the beginning messages, to go back and listen to those or reading back in Genesis of the story of Joseph uh, and begin to pray through that. Because today, something happens in Joseph's life. It's like this shift 
begins to, to move. And I believe in your calling and my calling and your dream and my dream and your aspect and relationship with God. There comes a moment in time when a shift takes place where we go from receiving, where we go from looking out in our lives to where we go, okay, now it's time to move. Now it's time to take a step in faith. Now it's time to shift a little bit. And right now in Genesis chapter 41, this is what's happening. Joseph has received this dream and now it's like God is saying, hey, I'm opening up the door of opportunity. Now it's your turn to move. Now it's your turn to shift that mindset a little bit that we see here. And so uh, before I just want to catch us up a little bit. You guys still with me? All right. We're in Genesis chapter 41. But in order for us to understand where we're picking up in Genesis chapter 41, we have to understand where Joseph is right now in the situation that he's in. If you remember, he was sold into captivity by his brothers. I mean, come on, his brothers sold him into captivity. And then he finally was working and moving up with uh, Potiphar, an official there uh, in Egypt. And then the Potiphar's wife comes on to him. And then he's thrown back in to prison, into the dungeon, and he's sitting there waiting. You see, what happens now is now there's these two guys that get on Pharaoh's bad side. One is a baker and one is a cupbearer. If you guys remember Nehemiah, a cupbearer was one who would uh, taste the drink to make sure it's not poison and then give it to the king. That sounds like a pretty good job, right? But like he, he does that just to make sure. And, and so we got a cupbearer and a baker. He gets on the bad side of the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh throws them into the dungeon. So they end up in the same prison as Joseph. Joseph is right now has gotten favor from God and he is over the entire prison. I mean, come on, think about that. He got thrown into prison. God showed him so much favor, so much wisdom that he started moving and shaking. And now he's over the whole thing. He's in it, but yeah, he's over it. And as he's walking in the prison, he notices these two guys are kind of sitting uh, sad and dejected. What I love about Joseph, the Bible picks up that uh, he sees that. He notices that about them. And he goes, hey, what's wrong with you guys? And they stop and they both go, hey, uh, uh, something's going on. And, and we, we had this dream. And both of us had a similar dream, but we don't understand it. And we think it means something. And we can't shake, we can't sleep, like all these things. And we just want to know what it means. And Joseph, I love it. Because if you remember when Joseph first got in trouble with his brothers, what happened? He received a dream. And he interpreted his own dream. And he said, hey, y'all are going to, you're my brothers and my dad, y'all are going to bow down to me. I'm going to have influence and power over you. And that's what got him in trouble in the first place, right? They were like, you were already the favorite. Now you're bragging that we're going to be bowing down to you. And so uh, it gets him into trouble. But now he has, they have a dream. And Joseph goes, okay, I, I can tell you what this dream means. And he goes and he interprets this dream. You see, God was speaking to people in the Old Testament in different ways uh, because the Holy Spirit would descend on particular people at a particular time uh, during that time. And so Joseph received this special uh, anointing, this special favor so that he could interpret dreams in this moment. And now God is saying, hey, as a New Testament believer, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. You can talk to God every single day. You have God's word in front of you that I can speak to you through my word. But during this particular time, God would use these avenues and dreams was one of those avenues. And so he gave Joseph the power to interpret these dreams. Now he tells one of them this amazing interpretation. He goes, hey, you had this dream. This is what the dream means. In three days on Pharaoh's birthday, uh, you were going to be restored back to your position. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so good. And then he gets to the baker and he turns to the baker and he says, okay, uh, 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 see what's happening here. See, with me, I'm trying to like explain away. But he goes to the baker and he says, basically, you're not going to make it out of the prison a lot. You, you're not going to make it in this position. But Joseph interprets it. You, and one reason you know that he's telling the truth is because he doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't tell people or tickle their ears. He says, hey, this is what is going to happen. This is what the dream means. And God's trying to tell you this. And three days later, guess what? It happens. And Joseph goes, hey, can you, can you give me a good word? When you go see the Pharaoh, he tells the cupbearer, when you go see the Pharaoh, can you give me a good word so that I can get out of here, tell him about me that I'm in here, I'm still hanging out. And so the cupbearer goes, and good old Joseph, guess what happens? He forgets. And he goes on, he's like, woo, 
I'm free, freedom. And he leaves Joseph in there for two more years. Think about that, two more years that Joseph is still. And the Bible all of a sudden just kind of like picks up and jumps to those two years. But you got to think about Joseph sitting there, still being faithful, still living inside of those two years. And we learned this uh, truth last week that we can't control what happens to us, but we can control what comes through us. And so Joseph can't control that, but he says, okay, I'm still going to be here. I believe God's got a plan. He gave me this dream. He'll make it come to pass in his due time. And two years later, guess who has a dream? Pharaoh himself has a dream and he has in fact two different dreams and it is like pulling tormenting him the man can't sleep you ever had a dream where you wake up and you're like I can't sleep my wife is good at waking me up when she has a bad dream she's like hey hey let me tell you about my dream and, and waking up right that happened to you but she has this dream she can't sleep my wife's right here she's so awesome yay okay um, <laughs> she has this dream or he has this dream and he brings all of his people together. He brings the magicians. He brings the wise men. All these people he's surrounded himself with. And he goes, can you tell me what this dream means? I know it means something. Can you please just tell me? And all of them step back and go, Ugh, how are we supposed to tell you that? We can't tell you what this dream is about. And then the cupbearer has a bright idea. He goes, hang on a second. I met this guy when you, you, when you threw me into the judge and threw me into prison. Like I met this guy who interpreted my dream. And in fact, it came true. And in fact, I think I was supposed to tell you about him a long time ago. But now let me tell you about him. His name is Joseph. And you need to, you need to he can come and he can do this for you. And so uh, Pharaoh, he, he gets all excited. And he says, get me this man named Joseph. And so Joseph receives the call. And and this is where we pick up here in Genesis uh, chapter 41, verse 14. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. I love to talk back and forth. You know, I like to I know I'm not alone here. So uh, verse 14, this is what happened. It says, So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he, became, he came before the Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you, when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. This is Joseph. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I love Joseph's response because in that moment, he has the opportunity to take every ounce of credit. He has every opportunity going, oh, I got some special knowledge. I am so smart. I can read. I can look at you and interpret this and I can tell you all that. But Joseph stops. And this is, this is a characteristic of even Jesus. Because if you remember Jesus in the New Testament, he's walking and a rich young ruler comes up to him and he goes, hey, good teacher. And Jesus goes, whoa, uh, I'm not like, whoa, this isn't good. Only God is good. And so Jesus shows us this. He's like, hey, we have an opportunity to redirect people away from us and towards God. And going, oh, 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 look, I don't have that much to offer, but I know the one who does. I know my dad, my father in heaven, who needs to have all the credit and all the glory. You and I have an opportunity without being great theologians to go, wait a second. This is, this is not me who is great, but God who is great. And he's working this inside of my life. And Joseph does this. I just thought that was worth noting and so powerful. We pick up and continue here in verse 17. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows, fat and sleek. They gazed among the reeds. After them seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. That's a good mental picture right there. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows. No, uh, seven fat cows that came up first, but even after they ate them, no one could tell them that they had done. Uh, no one, I'm so sorry, I'm losing my place. But even after they ate them, no one could tell them that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain. He's going into the other dream. Full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin, and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but no one could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to the Pharaoh, boom, right here he speaks. Then the dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good 
cows are seven years, of the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one in the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward the seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the all abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. And so you may hear that first and hear those two different dreams and go, what? Right? Like you read that for the first time, you go, okay, you got cows, you got fat cows, skinny cows, you got heads of grain, no heads of grain, and all this is happening. And Joseph goes, let me tell you what is about to happen. God gave it to you because it's about to happen quickly. He said the ugly cows, you guys with me right here? Yeah? I love having you guys in here. It's kind of nice. You got the ugly cows right here. Eight the fat cows, right? And yet after you look at these cows, they are still skinny. They didn't gain any weight. And he says, hey, what's going to happen is that there is going to be these seven years where you are going to receive so much fruit, so much produce, so much of abundance. And then the next seven years, what's going to happen is that there's going to be complete famine. Everything's going to be wiped out. It's going to be so bad that you're going to forget how good the first seven years years was. And he's preparing Pharaoh and he's saying, hey, I'm telling you this. And so Joseph and Pharaoh start to have a conversation. Pharaoh goes, hey, we should do something about this. How do we prepare for this? And then he looks to Joseph, right? Remember the shift that is happening right now, the shift that begins to move. God gave him this dream that, hey, I'm going to put you in a position of influence and power. He gave him this dream. And all of a sudden the shift takes place where Joseph goes from being in the prison where he is called and ordained by God and put in position to move into it. And what, I, what is incredible about Joseph's story is that Joseph could have been like, uh, I don't know how to interpret that. Like he could have known, but he could have, fear could have crept in and said, if I am wrong, I'm going to look ridiculous. Or Pharaoh could even take me out. Pharaoh could throw me back in prison for even longer. Like, how do I know God's going to give me the answer? But what happened is Joseph knew what God called him to do. He trusted God and the gifts and talents that he had given him. And when the opportunity arise, Joseph became an answer. I believe that is something for you and I to realize that God put you on this earth because you you are an answer to a problem in this generation and in this world that you are an answer. And in fact, you and I are image bearers of the most high king. And when you and I come to know Christ, we are walking and living answers for every person that we walk by. And if they need an answer, his name is Jesus. And we have that answer living inside of us. But I want to get a little more specific. I believe that if you and I realize that we are called to be an answer to the problems around us. And in fact, when somebody says, hey, I have a problem, well, as Christians, we should go, ooh, okay, hang on a second. There's an opportunity here. Because only God can take a problem and move it into an opportunity to reveal His glory. And that's how powerful God is. And that's how incredible he is. And Joseph, he became an answer to Pharaoh's problem. When he went into prison, he became an answer to the warden's problem. When he got, went back into prison, he became an answer to Pharaoh's problem. And everywhere he went, he was an answer to the problem around us. And, and kids right here, I want you to tell you something so amazing that your parents would absolutely love. That when you walk into your house and you see something like the dishes piling up, that's a problem, right? You go, you know what? I'm going to be an answer, and I'm going to serve my parents. And I'm going to wash these dishes so squeaky clean. Woo! Your parents walk in, and they just pass out, right? Like They're just like, whoa, what happened? But it would be, add so much great value. I mean, that's what God has given us, birthed inside of us. And maybe you walk up, and you're like, you know what? There's a problem. The house is dirty. Let me clean this up. Let me help with the grass. Whatever it is. Hey, mom's having a hard time today. Let me just let me give her a big old hug, a kiss on the cheek, and say, you're the greatest mommy in the world, right? You become an aunt to a problem or what if we walked into our workplaces and all of a sudden we overhear our boss going you know what this is a problem and we're like oh let me pray about this how, how can I be an answer to the problem that you're facing right now 
I believe your boss will look at you and go, Ooh, okay, I need to hold on to them. I like the way they think. I like this right here. And, and God begins to use us because there's this little prayer. Um, he may have put it on the screens already. I believe this is a prayer that Joseph prayed right here and that, that we get to think about in our lives. Lord, help me to be an answer. God, make me an answer to the problems that are around me. Because I believe God's positioned you in this generation, in this moment of time for a reason. And he's placed a dream inside of your heart. And maybe you don't even understand it yet. Maybe a ministry inside of your heart. You're like, I don't know how all this is going to come together. I don't know how God is going to use me in this. But when you start acting and moving on that steps of faith, all of a sudden God makes the next step clear and the next step clear. And God begins to grow us and show us in those moments what he is doing. So God, help me to be an answer around me. You see, we planted this church in Bluffton, South Carolina because we wanted to be an answer. Did you know that there are 101,000 people in this county who do not know Christ? Who on the census checked, I don't go to church anywhere. I'm not affiliated with anything about God. That many people around us every single day. We saw that and said, God, make me an answer, right? That we get to walk into this county. And that's why I'm so thankful for volunteers. I remember our first uh, interest meeting. Uh, Julie and Jarrett showed up. They love the spotlight anyway. But uh, then in the back, they showed up to the very first interest meeting. We didn't have any, I mean, we had the Clarks and the Casnays or the volunteers, right? And we're just hanging hanging out and they walked up and they were an answer to the a problem that was arise and God began to use them. Every volunteer that walks through these doors, every volunteer that just served at VBS, you were an answer. The kids were walking in and they wanted to see the love of Christ and maybe they just needed a community and you were an answer to that problem. I believe God's called us to be an answer to what is in front of us and God has given us specific gifts. And so when we step back and say, Lord, Make me an answer today. God, use me for your glory. I believe it's a powerful prayer. Be careful now. Don't start praying if you don't want God to start moving in your life and shaking because he'll start keeping you up at night. And you're like, oh, what is happening? Like, why, why am I still thinking about this? Why am I still thinking about this particular people or these particular kids? It's because he's make, trying to make you an answer in this situation. You guys, you guys still rolling with me here? Yeah. We're going to read the last little bit of piece of scripture, and then we're going to uh, get ready to close. I know we got the younger guy. You guys still okay? You guys still good? Good? Awesome. You guys are listening so good. It's, I love it. Uh, we'll just go all day. Y'all want to go all day? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. All the parents are like, okay, come on, son. No. Um, <laughs> we see these beautiful pictures of what Joseph is doing. And another truth that I believe Joseph has that we can pray is we can step back and we can say, Lord, I pray that you help me to see the opportunities that are in front of me and move into them. Because Joseph was sitting in prison. He's the answer to a problem, but he could have just sat back. He could have not moved. He could have let fear move. He could have let fear cripple him. He could have stopped in the moment and saying, well, I'm not enough. I, I, I can't do this. You don't know what I've done in my past. God, you can't use me in this situation. And he could have stopped. But Joseph realized, hey, this is my opportunity. The dream God implanted in my mind and my heart when I was 17 and now I'm close to 30 is finally beginning to shift, finally beginning to happen. And I see the opportunity. And I have the opportunity to take it. But I believe that sometimes we have to see that opportunity. We have to, once we see it, then the shift has to take place where you and I, our faith becomes real. Where we say, okay, God, you spoke this into my life. You spoke this into my heart. Your word says that, hey, I will give you power to be witnesses, right? And then when the opportunity comes, you and I have to have the faith to step into it. To go, okay, God, use me now. This is the moment. This is my opportunity. And I believe we pray that prayer. What if, what if we prayed this prayer like every time we go into Walmart? Say, Lord, help me to see the opportunities 
and move into there. Maybe, hey, I'm going into work today, Lord. Help me to see the opportunities that are around me and to step into it and to make something of that opportunity. God, as a parent, oh, come on, I need this prayer as a parent, right? Uh, Lord, help me to see a teachable moment as a parent and move into it, right? Like we pray this for God to open our eyes to see those opportunities. And then you and I, there's a moment where God says, okay, I've laid the foundation. Everything is set now. You have to have the faith to step into it. And when you step into it, it looks like nothing is going to happen. And then God swoops in and moves through you. And can I tell you from experience, it's one of the most thrilling things you could ever do in your life. I call it the thrill of obedience. When we step in obedience, it's like, ooh, okay, this that was amazing, God. I cannot believe you just used me like that. I can't believe you connected the dots that way. Because you and I had the faith to go, you know what, God, this is an opportunity. It looks like a problem to everybody else. But for me as a follower of Christ, this is an opportunity to pray for them, to pray over them, to point them, to go, hey, let me, let me connect you to Jesus. He, he's the powerful one. He's the incredible one. He's the one that can help you move past that guilt or that shame or that hurt. Whatever it is, He's the one that can do that. And we become an answer to those around us, just like Joseph reveals us here. Okay, we're going to close. I'm gonna, let me read this. You got you ready right here? Y'all listening? Listening? Awesome. So good. Verse 41, it says, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And people shouted before him, Make way, thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name uh, Zephaniah. We got that? Any, if you need baby names, just write these down. And gave him Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, uh, priest of On, to be his wife. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old uh, when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout Egypt. During the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentiful. Joseph collected all the food and produce, those seven years of abundance of Egypt, and stored it in the cities. In each city, he put food grown in fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. I love this last few uh, sentences here. If we zone in and get this. Before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of Nun. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God made me forget all my trouble in all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Man, I read verse 52, and it like exploded off the page. And I thought, wow, Joseph, who's been through all of this trial, all of this hurt, all of this suffering, he steps back and goes, I believe that God is faithful in the mess. God is faithful in the trials, that he's with me in the fire. So much so that he took my suffering and produce fruit from that suffering. That was worth just coming, just to read that verse today. I promise that was worth coming today, this morning. That verse is so powerful that you and I can hang on to it, that even in my suffering, the, the amazing beauty and power of Jesus Christ can take something like a death on a cross and turn it around to be a symbol of freedom. He is saying, hey, our suffering is not the end. Our trial is not the end, but God will move move and shake in that and rise us up from the ashes again and saying even in that suffering they will produce a fruit in you and people will sit back and go how in the world are you having this happen in your life after what you have been through and you and I can go oh I did not do it his name is Jesus he did this in my life he brought me through it he didn't just pick me up and protect me in this nice little bubble but in fact, he walked through it with me. 
And I got to know Jesus even more because of it. I got to experience Him in an incredible way. And so no matter where we are, where we're thinking in our life, and if, you know, our, our young right here, Lucas, hey, buddy, you're so handsome. Um, where we are in our life, we can always hold on to that and say, right now I'm maybe in trial, I, I'm maybe in the suffering, but I know I, God's Word says it, that He can make fruit come out of this. And let Joseph's life be a testament of going, if we hold on to the promises of God, that he is faithful to come through. He is faithful to help us through that. And we will grow and move out of that place stronger than where we were. If we trust him at his will and going, God, help me to be an answer. Even even though I, I, I myself need an answer. God, help me to see it. I love that prayer because it takes the eyes off of us and goes, God, how can I be an answer out here? How can I begin to invest in the people around me? And God will produce a fruit inside of our life that we've never experienced before. And so I love to pray for us this morning. And maybe you came in this morning and you just, you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And my prayer for you today is that you would trust God in this moment. And maybe for you, uh, you've never said, you know what, I, I don't even have a relationship with Christ. And this morning, my, I hope that you would stop and say, you know what, how do I have that relationship with Him? How do I gain that promise that you're talking about? How do I experience God every single day? Well, I have an answer. And His name is Jesus, and He loved you so much that he left heaven to walk this earth and died on the cross and three days later showed us power over sin and death and rose again. And the Bible says if we believe that in our heart and confess that with our mouth, then we will be saved. And so I'd love to talk to you after service or maybe you say, hey, I want to accept Christ and you fill out that connect card and check that box and we get a chance to talk and connect after that. But maybe we're in the room and you're saying, Daniel, you know what? I, I just need God to open my eyes. God, I, I, I need God to breathe fresh dreams and vision and life into my heart and into my family. I just want to pray for us. These prayers that we talked about today that God showed through Joseph. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your truth. Thank you for the word that we get to open it, God, that it strengthens us, that it speaks truth into our life. God, I pray right now in Jesus' name, all the young kids that are in the room, I pray you instill inside of their life, inside of their heart, God, that you keep breathing dreams into their life, God, that we know they are an answer for their generations and generations to come. God, I pray that we as parents and grandparents realize that the power that you have given us to pass down the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ into our family and that you have given us that answer, God. I pray that you will give us the faith to step into the opportunities that you place before us. God, I pray that if somebody walked in this place and they're battling with so much mentally, God, I pray that you release that in Jesus' name. I pray for healing over somebody who maybe is sitting on their past going, God, I can't move past this. God, I pray that you give them the strength to say, Jesus, I give you my past. I give you my hurt, my mistakes. God, and I pray that each and every person in this room realizes that we are here in this together. We are a family. And you bring us together through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may we trust that. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.